Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this professional learning opportunity. I am Scott Mathias from NCEA and I will be facilitating this webinar today. Just a few housekeeping notes as people are joining. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A or chat windows. We will be monitoring the questions and we'll try to answer them all in the allotted time. After today's webinar, I will email everyone a link to the recording as well as an online survey. Once you fill out the survey, a certificate of completion for the webinar will be emailed to you. Today's webinar, E-Rate is for Everyone, is being led by Sister Dale McDonnell, Vice President of Public Policy for NCEA. Before I turn it over to our presenter, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear God, we come to you today asking your blessing on our school leaders and teachers. Thank you that they have answered the call to lead our schools and teach at our schools so that our children might learn in a safe and nurturing environment conducive to academic and personal success. Bless our school professionals with wisdom, integrity, patience, and the physical and mental energy equal to their tasks. Bless them with strong support from their communities. Give them insight, reward them by allowing them to see the fruits of their labor, displayed in the success of their schools. Accept our prayer today as an expression of our gratefulness to you and to them for their dedication in making our schools a central and vital part of their communities. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Sister Dale, thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Happy you were able to join us for this presentation on the E-Rate uh, School Discounted Technology Program. Uh, we are um, soon to be beginning another cycle, so it's important that uh, people get the latest information and to um, get prepared for applying for this program. So what I'd like to do today is do a little bit about the origins of the E-Rate Program how this program is administered. We'll look at what kind of support, what does the program provide? How do you calculate your discount since it is a discount technology program? I'll do a little bit about the application process and some other requirements. And then of course the Q and A. So to begin, the E-Rate program began with the Telecommunication Acts of 1996. In that, the program called for an education program, which we since then, since then have dubbed the E-Rate program to provide eligible schools and libraries, telecommunication services. That includes internet access and internal connections. At one point, it did also include um, phone service. Um, applicants can be nonprofit schools, libraries, or consortium. Uh, it can be a nonprofit school. The only limitation is that um, the school does not have an endowment of more than $50 million. So likely uh, hood of, of many of our schools um, not being eligible is pretty slim. So most of our schools um, are eligible to apply. Um, and the applicants must apply every year. This is not a once and done. Um, unfortunately, you have to go back each year in, in the time frame allotted and apply for what you need. Um, and since 2016, when they reformed the, um, the whole prospectus on the E-rate program, um, the focus now is really on broadband deployment to the classroom. And the, um, the program rules have changed somewhat. So if you're someone who's been around and using this program for a while, um, some of this may be new to you as we move down the line, but um, what I'm presenting today is what the program will look like for application year 2023, which will um, be coming up soon. The exact date for when that uh, application process begins has not yet been released by the FCC. So a piece of note uh, would be that the funding for the program, which originally began as a $2.5 billion and was such for a number of years, um, 
was inadequate, we found out over the years to fund all the requests that were in. And so they began to, at the FCC, um, in, index this to the inflation. And so this year, um, the program is expected to have $5 billion um, to be expended on requests for services. So there's a great deal of money available. Um, all of us in, in our Catholic schools are available. This program uh, was um, originally conceived um, as equitable for everyone. I worked over the years with libraries and other schools, public schools and other private schools. Each school applies on its own or each district. We're not in competition. It's not like any of the other federal programs where you go through the state or through the uh, local district in which you are located. There's no competition among sectors. If you apply and you're within the, the limits, you're within the application requirements, um, your, your, your application is as good as anybody else's. So that's a really important piece to keep in mind. So the program is overseen by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Um, they have authority over the universal services programs. They have a company, it's a quasi-government independent agency that will collect the funds for the FCC to administer this program. And within USAC, it's the schools and libraries division that runs this program. So that when you are trying to find out information about the program, uh, or have questions, the schools and libraries website as, as a page of the USAC, the Universal Services Administrative Company, it is the one that you would consult. So the program right now has everything being um, looked at in terms of the uh, online so that, I'm sorry, this has just jumped. The, um, the, the site that, sorry, the site that um, is important is the usac.org e-rate. That's the IT, they have the IT system set up. The platform on which all activity takes place is called the EPIC, the E-Rate Productivity Center. They, they refer to it as EPIC. That's the point of entry. So in order to begin to apply for the E-Rate program or to update your information on the E-Rate program, you have to go into this EPIC Center. And to begin, you need to have an, uh, an FCC registration number, the FRN. Simply um, go in and apply for that. All of the information, if you go to the page there at, at USAC, you will see how to register for the FRN. It simply is your identification for anything you're doing with the FCC, whether it's E-rate or some other program, which most of us will not be dealing with, but that's the your, your ID within the FCC portal. Right now, the EP, EPIC administrative window is open. Um, FCC likes to call any time frame that they're working things around a window. So you'll see a window here and later you'll see a window in the application process. Right now, the um, EPIC window is open for making any changes to your profile. So between now, it opened last week, and um, when they decide to close it, which may be sometime in December or January, you have an opportunity to go in and, and um, edit your profile. So if you've had a massive increase in enrollment and now you're going in and you want to apply for another 75 more in your school or um, a diocese is applying on behalf of all of its schools and one or two have closed or they may have opened a new one, that's where you go in now. So once they open up the um, application window, uh, you can't go in and make any changes. So it's important if you are already working with FC, with the uh, E-rate program that you go in and make sure your profile, your school profile or your diocesan profile is correct. Or if you're starting anew, uh, which I hope many of you who, who have not participated will be doing this time around, uh, that you will create the profile that matches your school for this school year. 
Okay, so what does what happens with the E-rate program? All right, with the E-rate program, these are the kinds of services that you can obtain. They break it down into category one and category two. So category one is your telecom services. Up until 2020, you could get your telephone um, services discounted the way you get the rest of it. Um, that goes back to when the program was first begun in 1997. And the way you connected to the internet was through your phone line. They went through the regular phone, then they went up to higher speed with DSL and so on. So that uh, phone service was in there and continued through. So many schools went into cell phones um, as well as the regular landlines. Um, over time, that became a huge part of the budget uh, of that $2.5 billion, billion dollars, and was eating up a lot of the bandwidth uh, in terms of money, and um, they decided that everyone had a cell phone anyway, and they were not going to continue any phone service after 2020, because nobody dials up pretty much anymore. Uh, it pays for your internet access, so whatever company you use to get your internet, uh, whether it's, you know, a dish or it's a regular, you know, corporate company that puts out the um, internet services, that's included as well as basic conduit. So how do you get to the, how do you get to be able to open up AOL or whatever else it is you use? Those are all discounted. T category two deals with internal connections. And this is where um, the focus is now pretty much on trying to build up an intensely um, robust communication system in every classroom. And so, communications, wiring, routers, switches, hubs, network service, some networking software. I mean, that's the software you may need to operate the network, not any kind of content program. Wireless LENs and then fiber, dark fiber or lit fiber. Um, that would be if you're acquiring fiber, you're trying to build your own network with the fiber. What you can't get discounted are computers and program software training, modems, cable modems, uh, mics, et cetera. There is on the USAC website, on the schools and libraries part of that, where when you go to USAC, you just hit E-rate and everything you need will be there. There is what they call eligible services lists. And it, it lists down quite simply everything that you're able to obtain discounts for under this program, and then they have what you're not able to. So it's important that you check the eligible services list to see if what you're looking for is covered. So calculating discounts, all right, this is the important part of how you figure out what is your discounted rate. And when we're looking at the discounted rate, what that means is that you pay so much and the provider pay so much so that uh, if you are getting internet access and you are in a discounted rate of 60%, it means that when you know Comcast or whoever puts out the bill, bills you for 40%, the undiscounted portion, and they bill the FCC for their 60%, all right? So the amount of discount you receive is certainly the significant concern for all of this. So you have to <clears throat> base your poverty counts on the income eligibility guides, guidelines from the federal lunch program. So basically income at or below 185% of the poverty level. And what's different from some of the other programs you may be uh, able to um, participate in, say under um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, there's only one way in which you can calculate and prove your eligibility income levels. And that's either through a survey, some actual data from a family, um, either from a survey or from existing sources so that each child must have some individual verification of poverty status. You can't extrapolate. You can't do some of the things you can do with Title I. You need an actual count. The, uh, besides the survey, then you can use the alternative discount mechanisms. And so that's, you know, if families 
uh, participate in any of the federal assistance programs. Um, so you can go through, you know, food stamps, SNAP, to all of these programs. Um, the um, existing sources, other, and so anything that you can find in the poverty guidelines and in the federal programs that um, a, a family participates in would qualify as their eligibility. Um, again, it's the school gets the discounted services, but it's based on individual students. So, you know, if you get it for one in the family, you count the other siblings who are in school, et cetera. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the discount rate is significant. So in the first column, the percentage of students eligible for federal nutrition program, and then category one services again, which is your, your access to internet, your internet service. And category two is for all of the broadband pieces um, for you know, the connectivity within in the school and classroom. So if you have less than 1% of the students or you don't want to bother to figure out, you don't think you have enough to worry about it, just for showing up, you will get 20% discounted rate uh, if you are in urban and 25% if you're in a rural area. Going all the way down to 90% if you have 75% or more in um, poverty uh, and, and that's for category one and for category two, 85%. So, you know, whether you pay full price or you pay 15% or you pay 40%, um, there's some significant savings here, even, even for the smallest amount of services that you may be requesting. So it is worth the time and effort to file an application to receive these benefits, particularly, you know, as we've learned going through our COVID experiences and the continued emphasis on technology as part of you know, how your curriculum is shaped. Uh, it's important that you're able to have every student in the school be able to access what he or she needs in the classroom so that you don't have kids trying to wave around their, lap their laptops or their, their tablets trying to see if they can catch a wave. You, know, you need to have sufficient um, bandwidth in every classroom that all students are able to access what they might need for their learning. The uh, urban or rural status, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the FCC defines that and it's automatically built into the system. Once you put your zip code in, um, in the portal, um, you are automatically labeled urban or rural. So it's one thing you don't have to worry about. So in 2016, um, the FCC, well, really 2015, they began to look at the program. We had a lot of complaints about the program, particularly for the category two services. Um, those are funded, and I'll say, I'll do that in a minute, uh, but they fund the, the most needy first. So they were funding 90% first, then 85, 80, and so on. And you know, people that were below 70 were hardly ever able to access any category two services. That it was all being spent by the more uh, high end poverty groups. And what the FCC started to realize, and a lot of it came from complaints from people who were below the 70 mark, that many of the big public school districts who apply as a district, the public schools generally apply for all of their schools in one. Um, what they were able to do was to get, you know, for school A, all of this stuff, because they were 90%. And then the next year, move some of that services to some 82% school and reapply in the 90% category and get some of the same stuff, the upgraded stuff for these schools. And so, people began to not apply if they were below a certain poverty level, figuring why bother. And, uh, you know, others were um, concerned about the equity of this. You know, it was supposed to provide equity in access to this. And so the FCC began to look at what are we spending the money on? How are we getting a return on our investment? And how are we making this more equitable? And so, what they decided in the first place was that they would focus primarily on F Wi-Fi. 
and broadband services and distributed equitably. So this is where um, we'll come to the next slide. I'll show you how they try to uh, maximize opportunities for everyone. Then um, what they were looking at is um, what they were terming gold plating. You know, are we getting the best and the brightest of every shiny thing that was out there, whether we actually needed it or not, and whether or not it was the most cost effective? You know, if you could get services in one part of the country for $28 a month and they were charging 56 someplace else, you know, is that the most cost effective? And so they have protocols in place now really looking at uh, what, what would be reasonable expectation to pay for services in certain parts of the country? And are you within those reasonable guidelines? So it's trying to be most cost effective so that the money goes farther. And then trying to streamline and simplify the process and the overall program administration. Um, I will be honest, it is not an easy process. But once you do it, you've got the mechanics down. And the question is, how much do you update it the next year? Do you want the same stuff? Well, then just copy it back in. Do you want to upgrade certain things? Then you put that into the application process. So it's important to think about the overall benefits and not to have the initial expenditure of energy to fill out the form deter you from that. Um, as I said at the beginning, all of our schools have been equally able to apply for this program. Um, we have never gone above 46% of our schools nationwide applying for the program. There's something wrong there. You know, when every public school and every li public library uh, accesses these funds and gets this program going for their constituents, we should be there as well. And um, it's the application process that I hear from people that's holding them back. To make it more equitable, the um, FCC has put in a minimum budget. All right, this is, this is really key, um, that every school is, is guaranteed a minimum amount of funding for category two over a five-year period. These numbers are a minimum, all right? So that right now the pre-discounted rate um, is $167 per student, okay, for category two. The sing if you are a single school and you have you know fewer children than what 167 would do to make it possible for you to engage in this program in a meaningful way, um, the single school minimum is either the 167 per student or $25,000, whichever is greater. So if you are a small school with 80 something children, um, you're guaranteed at least 25,000 over the five year period. And that's to prevent, you know, the, the five year period is to prevent districts and schools from constantly upgrading what is sufficient. So that you can only apply for the same thing once in five years. But this category uh, budget is a minimum so that if you are in an 85% um, poverty level or you're in a 65% poverty level, there may be opportunity for you, depending on who else supplies and how far the budget goes, to get a lot more than the minimum. But this is what you're guaranteed over five years. So that, you know, if you have 200 students in the school and the per pupil rate is 167 the, uh, students, you're guaranteed 33,400. That's the pre-discounted. And then you apply the discounted. So out of that, you would get $20,000 toward what it is you want to uh, apply. And the other 40%, you would have to, um, you would have to put in. Some reason that's not going. Okay. So the funding priorities, this is important. This is how they dole out the money, basically. All category one applications are funded first. So whatever you put in that's eligible services for getting connected to some form of internet um, is funded for everybody. And then they go to 
category two, beginning with the neediest. So then for category two, they start with the 85s, the 70s. This used to be before 2016 um, application period, it used to be 90%. But um, in order to provide more equity and to have more funding available, um, the FCC decided after receiving comments um, from the public that uh, schools should be uh, required to pay at least 15%. So now the category two, so they start with 85 and work their way down. The um, file book separately for category one and category two. So you do your category one as one application, you do your category two as a second. So I said, all category ones go first and then category two, depending on uh, how far the money goes in terms of the poverty levels of the schools. You have to file within the application window, the schools and library division application window. That is usually open for about 60 days. And so, you have to complete the filing process. The, the two forms um, that I'll explain in a minute, Form 470 and 471, have to be completed within that window. Otherwise, you're out of luck for that year. So if they don't extend the window, unless there's some real um, extenuating circumstances, but I think only once or twice they've expended, extended the window a day or two. So you work within the time frame. Um, that and usually they open it. I think I said earlier somewhere in December. Sometimes it's gone into January and it's open for about sixty days. So this is a quick look at the application process, and then I'll do a little more on each of these areas. So it looks pretty good right here, right? You just go through, follow the arrows, and there you are. It's a little more complicated than that, but this is the basic schema. So. APM and use AP here as the applicant. So the applicant files form 470 to describe services and open competitive bidding. I'll say more about the competitive bidding in a minute, but you file a 470 form that says, this is what I intend to apply for. I would like this service, this service in category one. And then in the category two, I would like, you know, four more hotspots per classroom or you know, whatever it is that you're you're looking to um, obtain. And you post that on the FCC website, on this schools and libraries part of that website. You must have that form up for 28 days before you move to form 471. So 470 is where you say, this is what I'm looking to obtain. For many of our Catholic schools, there is not a lot of interest on the part of service providers. I'll be very honest. You know, if you've got a school, you know, with 170 kids that wants a couple of basic things and the service provider is looking at LA Unified or New York City Board of Ed, um, you know, they don't even want to bother spending time with you. So that, you know, very frequently it turns out that most of our schools use the same provider year after year because they're the only one who wants to do business with you, frankly. But you still have to post it up there and let other people see it and decide if they want to bid on it. And so the form is up there. And after 28 days, you can go in and you can see, well, you know, this, a, this company wants internet, this company wants internet. The only people that want internet is the people I'm dealing with. Whatever that is, you look at what they're offering and then you make a selection. Uh, and that's Form 471. And I'll talk about that on the next page. Then the AP, the applicant notifies, once you've chosen people, you will get a letter. Um, now they do an email, but you will hear from uh, the EFCC, yes, you have been approved or we have some questions, would you please answer these questions? And then you, eventually you will get a commitment letter. You'll get your category one letter separate from your category two letter. Once you have the go ahead from the FCC, then you deal with the vendor. So what is it that you ask to have done? If you wanna put in you know, um, some new wiring or some new hot spots that are going to go in drop spots in your classrooms. You may want to wait until summer. Um, 
the, the, the window starts July 1. So generally you can make all your agreements and then start the work after the 1st of July. Um, but you may need to extend it into the summer or even into the school year, depending on when you get your letter. So that once you, so once you have set up a timeline with the provider, then you send in this form 486 and you attach to it the SIPA, the Child Internet Protection Act. I'll talk about that in a minute that says, yes, we are in compliance with the safety requirements to protect our students. And then um, you move over to when the work is completed. So when the work is completed, there are two ways in which payment can be made. The first in, and this is the one that the providers like, but they're not, they, they can't force you to do this. The applicant has the choice of how the payments will go. So for most of the big districts, um, they use the bare form and that's the build entity um, application for reimbursement. That's where you have paid the provider upfront and then you get the money back from USAC. Until a couple of years ago, USAC had the money in a private bank and USAC dealt with you. Then under the last administration, the FCC chief put the money, he took the money away from USAC having their own bank account and put it in the federal treasury, which then made it federal funds. And so we worked hard with the FCC to retain the use of form 474, what they call the SPY form, the service provider invoice. So for our schools, we're telling everyone, make sure you use form 474. That's where the internet company, the contractor that put in whatever, bills you the undiscounted portion so that um, you will pay directly to the provider the 30%, the 20%, and the provider then goes to USAC to get the other 60, 80, whatever it is they're owed. All right, that is the best insulation we have for not having our schools re direct recipients of federal financial assistance, FFA. We've done this in several other workshops that you know once you accept federal dollars, then you become um, required to deal with a lot of issues um, that regard regarding Title VI, Title VII, Title IX, that uh, as ADA and so on, that you don't have to comply with if you are not a recipient of federal funds. So it's important that you do the 474. Uh, and we got assurances when this was being changed to include a bare form that um, the provider cannot force you to accept um, the bare form, that you have, the applicant has the choice of how the payments will go. And again, as I say, is our best assurance that you are not taking direct federal funds. The funds are going from the treasury to your provider. So let's look at the application process, competitive bidding. Okay, this is like a formal process. Um, so that anyone who's a provider can look at what you put up there and they can then go into their portion of the EPIC and uh, put down what it is that they are you know, willing to bid uh, for this service. So as I said, you, know, you may only get one on certain things. You may get two, you may get three. Um, that's hard to know. But um, what you need to do is to look at what's there, look at who's bid, look at you know, the quality of what they're doing, um, but the cost effectiveness is the first thing that FCC looks at, all right, that you, um, they're, you're expected to choose the most cost effective provider for the services that you require. All right, so, you know, it, it's not just the price because there may be things within a couple of dollars ranges, um, but one has a much better service provider record. So you need to look at that. And then once you do that, and you can't do that until after the 28 days from when you first put up your 470, it's there for 28 days, and then you go out and you start to make your choices. Um, once you evaluate the bids, you choose the one, as I said, that's most cost effective. And then you know you 
in that fourth form 70, you know, you've had like really looking at what, what is it going to cost, the dates of service, all of that that you deal with to provide. It's like, what's the contract that you're really willing to engage in with a potential um, successful bidder? Um, again, 471 cannot go up any time before the 28 days is up there. The competitive bidding process you can do, I mean, right now, if you know you want X, Y, and Z, and you already have your, you know, your FRN number and so on, you can go on and, and post what you want for the next, for the next round. Um, but you can't, you know, start the 471 until the window opens, um, which may or may not be 28 days after you have the first 470 form up. But right now, you should be looking at, you know, doing some kind of an audit on what you have available, working with the tech person in your school, or you may be the tech person who's on this, um, looking at what is it that we think we need, that we want to apply for, and that we can pay the undiscounted portion for. I mean, that's an important piece. Uh, it's great to put up, you know, all kinds of things that would make your school really operate well um, in terms of digital learning, but you have to pay for the undiscounted portion. So then you get to the application um, process um, being committed and, and then finalized. So the PIA, the Program Integrity Assurance, they're the people at USAC that check your form. They're looking at 471, they're looking at, oh, this school, you know, seven blocks away is getting the same service for $40 a month cheaper. Uh, what's your problem? You know, so um, they may come back to you with some questions. Um, once you get the letter from USAC, uh, then you file form that says, yes, you will receive X amount of dollars for the services for the year 2023-2024. Um, and then um, you file a form 486. And that really, that says, yes, we've signed a contract with whoever we're working with, whether they call it a formal contract or an MOU or whatever. Uh, and then you, you know, that the services will start on X date. And then uh, you indicate with that, you also then uh, attach the SIPA form that says, yes, I've done these things to assure um, protection for students who are accessing this. The libraries do similar for their patrons. Um, and then uh, you have agreed with the, and when you agree with the provider and you sign the 486, you have agreed on the method of payment. And um, once the services are um, in process, you pay your undiscounted portion. And then at the end of it, uh, you, you work with the provider, they file form 474, which you'll have to sign off on so that they get paid for their discounted portion. Um, the SIPA, the in Child Internet Protection Act of 2000, um, is, it was specifically designed for the E-rate. Um, Congress was very concerned about um, who gets to see what on the internet. And there've been a lot of um, privacy fights, mostly with the libraries rather than the schools. Um, but you know, you've know, you got to have blocking and filtering software on your devices, any devices that the students or teachers would use um, to prevent obscene or harmful content being available to students. So you have to um, you know, file that, whoops, you have to file that um, form. Okay, what SIPA requires um, are these pieces here. Like, as I said, that you have to have a policy, first off, that includes technology protection measures. So the school has a policy that this, this, this software has to be installed on all computers to prevent um, you know, blocking and filtering out pieces. Um, the third bullet, must hold a public hearing before policy adaptation. Um, what's sufficient here is that, you know, on your back to school night, um, you explain the policy to the parents, you explain it in, you know, positive terms, or you send out something to the family that says, this is the requirement. And that's where, you know, you tell them what you're putting in place. Uh, and what what are, you know, what is required of the student and the family to use um, school internet access? 
and uh, what are the consequences if they try to violate it. Um, you must also let parents know in the policy that online activities are being monitored, that someone at the school, someone who deals with the tech at the school has to uh, watch for, whoops, has to watch for um, problems, uh, monitor that people are not trying to get around it, um, and that um, you're looking at ways in which the policy works, and if it doesn't work, what you need to do to fix it. And then um, providing um, education um, to families, students, students, teachers, and families about, um, Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened here. We're providing information to students, teachers, and families about the policy, what's working, and how you expect, you know, the cooperation you expect. It's not like you don't have to have a, a major program about this, but you need to have something that's done publicly and something that's in your handbooks, parent handbooks, student handbook, teacher handbooks. Okay, as I said earlier, I think everything has to be done uh, electronically. Um, they're no longer accepting paper applications. Um, they're not notifying you with paper. Um, all of this, um, there's a lot of documents that will be produced within the whole application process, and um, you're required to keep those documents for 10 years. Uh, that's a problem for a lot of people. Um, finding space either, you know, in the cloud on your computers or paper filing, uh, you know, if you keep copies. Somehow, if you have a question, if they're looking for that there was some kind of waste, fraud, and abuse, that waste, fraud, and abuse is a, a favorite phrase of the FCC, checking for that. You can document what you did uh, and um, be safe. So the document retention, you have to keep basically everything the worksheets, the evaluation sheets, three companies put in, this is the bid that won, these are the bids that lost, this is, you know, and you'll have on the one that you chose, why you chose that one, um, and so on. So um, basically keep all the documentation. Uh, you can appeal um, if they first say no. Um, sometimes it may just be a clerical error. And, the, the PIA people are picky, I'll say that, um, that you have to have all the blocks filled in, you have to have the forms done in the right order, in the right time frame, um, and then um, you, you know, if there is a problem, you still have an opportunity to appeal it. So a few tips for trying to get this done. Okay, so as I said earlier, the application process, despite their best attempts, or half-hearted attempts to make this more uh, accessible and flexible. It's really um, a, a process. And so, you know, the first thing is try to download the forms and look at the whole thing at once so that um, you don't start putting stuff in and have to go back and correct it. So what's important is that while the principal of the school or the someone at the diocese is, if it's a diocesan application, is responsible for what's on the form, even though they don't have to fill it out. So that, you know, you may delegate, you may have someone in your school that's besides the tech, oh, it could be the technology person. It, it could be a parent who does work in technology and can figure out this form. Uh, or you may use a reputable company. There are lots of companies out there that do the forms for a fee. They'll do the forms, they'll answer any questions, They'll, you know, go with you if you have to have, you know, a hearing or whatever. Um, the only, um, the only uh, caveat is that if you choose a company, the company that writes the application with and for you cannot be a provider. So you can have, you know, somebody who's going to provide, you know, internet in the, in the classrooms uh, be the applicant uh, writer. So that's important. Uh, again, make sure you use the appropriate forms, the appropriate, you know, read all of the directions. If you have any questions, the Schools and Libraries website has Q&As. They have videos there that show you how to do certain things. Uh, make sure that you are requesting an eligible service. 
uh, file early, you know, file you have up until midnight on the day they decide the window closes. But, you know, you file, you know, at 11 p.m. on, you know, March 12th. Um, you don't have time to correct anything. You don't have time for the FCC to get back to you and say, this box is empty. You know, you, then your application is just gone. So um, it's important to do it as early as you can um, and um, allow yourself opportunity to be questioned if that, if that needs to happen for you to get what you're requesting. Um, the important piece too, though, is that next to the last piece, um, Remember that contracts are binding, even if you do not receive the discount. So you need to be careful about what it is that the commitment letter is giving you in terms of funding. Don't sign the contract until you have the actual funding letter. Otherwise, you're on the hook. So you sign a contract, you think you're going to get a 70% discount and you sign a contract with company A and then it comes through, your application had problems, they're not funding it, you still owe the contract or whatever it is you signed for. So make sure that you're clear about what it is, um, the total cost and whether or not you have the discount before you sign anything. Let me stop here and see what the questions are. Uh, Oh, okay. So this is where a question was about um, accepting federal funds and complying with things that don't align with our faith. And I, I guess I answered that to her satisfaction as I went through. Yes, if you file the form 474, you're not taking money. You're taking goods and services the way you do programs under Title One, Two, Three, Four. Okay, so that's our, you know, our best. Um, advice in terms of trying to avoid federal entanglement. Um, and we were able, um, as I said, we, we made a big push with that at the FCC, um, that the service providers were certainly, you know, pushing that everybody had to file a bare form, that they got paid. They didn't want to wait around for several months, you know, to get paid by the FCC. They wanted their money up front. So we still have, you know, the protection of filing the form 474. So before, okay, let me see, there's one more question here. Are firewalls included in category two? It depends. Um, you need to look at what the firewall is and um, generally it's not, but there may be um, something you can work out. Go into the eligible services list and um, look at that more carefully and the type of thing you're trying to put in. Um, okay. What, ser what services are eligible for benefits? Okay, that's back up in about slide three. Um, and um, that, that deals with um, what you need to have enough internal connections, broadband with, to be able to have students download and upload at minimum speeds. Um, well, you know, we're hoping the minimum speeds are pretty high. Um, when you go to the schools and libraries website, go to USAC's website on E-Rate, there is a list, a very specific list that changes every year in terms of what's available for um, the particular um, time period in which you're looking for it. We have one school with two campuses. Uh, we could use tons of, that could use tons of equipment. Well, you know, file. Uh, this is the person I'm at. They have one school, but two campuses. Um, this is where you need to update your profile. You know, will that building need to be updated before next July? Um, if so, then that's part of um, what you can apply. It sounds as if only new installations. I'm not sure what that means. Um, no, uh, yeah. hmm. No, new installations, no. Um, if you know, if what you have is not adequate, you certainly can add to it, or you can add additions. Um, again, it, it depends on what you're trying to add. But look at the eligible services list. Uh, do I need separate numbers for both campuses? If it's considered one school, even though it's on several campuses, one app, one um, one FRN number is fine. One application is fine for each for each category. Okay, I think I may have all the question. Okay, um, 
the next two slides are not E-rate, but they are programs administered by the FCC. And um, I bring them to your attention because this is ways to um, address students' need for connectivity at home. Uh, you know, no child should have to sit outside a McDonald's or a Starbucks or some other place trying to hope that their tablet will connect to um, the internet in the store or their cell phone. I mean, a number of kids are trying to work with the track phone. Uh, you know, there's no way to do homework. So this summer, um, the uh, Affordable Connectivity Program, again, is now funded at $14 billion. That's part of what came out of the whole COVID um, uh, relief packages, is to help eligible households get broadband they need for work, school, healthcare, and more. So this program has nothing to do with the school other than we're urging the school to let families know that um, they can get up to $30 a month off their internet bills, 75 if they're on tribal lands, uh, directly from the provider. So if they have, you know, uh, RCN, if they have Comcast, they have Cox, whatever is the, um, they apply directly and almost every, um, the, uh, every of the carriers um, has participated in this program. So, you know, schools should really make sure families, particularly low-income families, know that this is available. So they get $30 off the service. They can also get up to $100 toward the purchase of a laptop, desktop, or tablet um, that you know they contribute toward. Now, you know, this this um, you have to contribute more than $10 and less than $50 toward the purchase price. So you can't buy, you know, gold-plated stuff. You can get your basic, you know, Chromebooks and things of that sort. You can only get one to a family, but um. For some families, that one may be the only one or maybe the difference between two and three kids fighting over one tablet. So, you know, please look at this affordableconnectivitypro.gov uh, and let families know that that is available to them. The other FCC program we worked on over the summer, and this came from the uh, American Rescue Plan, again, um, the ARP plan, and this was a program that eventually wound up to be more than $6 billion, where the schools, and we had, you know, we had a crush this summer, you know, unfortunately, some of these government agencies put out stuff at the worst possible times, and this came out in late July and August, where the school could apply to the FCC to get funds to buy laptops and, and um, hotspots, modems and so on that they could give to kids so they had connectivity at home. The school applied to the FCC uh, and you know, received funding to do this. We worked with the FCC and um, were able to get um, a, an exception for the private school so that they did not um, get billed directly. Um, you worked with providers who would be, you know, either the people who made, who sold you the modem, the um, the modems, or the um, hotspots, or the tablets, and they billed the FCC. They got paid from the FCC. We got the equipment to distribute to the kids and families that needed it. This can also be if you, you know, if some of your teacher aides or your even your teachers wind up, you know low income category, they can also um, have access to this. So over the summer, we had three different waves in which this money was distributed. It's all gone right now. What, what's, what I make this point here is that when you applied for this over the summer, you had to have an FRN number, you had to have, go through the E-rate process. It was a different category of money in a different format, but it was basically how you applied for um, E-rate. And so many of our schools got caught up in, we don't do E-rate, we can't do this. Yes, you could, but you had to go through the process of getting the number, getting registered in EPIC and so on. So we are working right now uh, with a number of other public school, dis public school aid organizations and uh, other you know, service providers to get an additional billion dollars in the appropriation cycle every year um, so that we know 
in in the last go round where they had the one billion dollars. Um, the application for that was more than 2.3 billion, <coughs> excuse me, so that not all of it got funded. And so there may be an opportunity opening soon if we get this in the, the CR, the continuing resolution of funding before the end of the school year for another round of these programs. So that you can get this equipment to give to students and teachers if they qualify to be able to continue education uh, in the event of another shutdown, or even, you know, as we've learned through the pandemic, the technology works, excuse me, <clears throat> as part of child's learning. And so more and more children are being required to do homework and to do assignments using, and even in, in class to do things that require them able to download and upload materials. So it's important that all students have access, similar access to learning tools. And so I, you know, I bring these two pieces to your attention apart from E-Rate. They're modeled on E-Rate, um, they're operated by the FCC, but it's not the 5 billion that's up for uh, dispersal um, come early next year. So, you know, I would urge all of you to make every attempt to get the E-Rate program into your school in ways that will boost your ability to provide digital access for all. And so um, if you need additional information, here are some of the, um, the portals you can go to. The E-Rate pro program fact sheet gives you some pretty quick look at some of this. And then um, if you want to contact me, here's my contact information. Um, this recording will be uh, made available to you if you wanna go back and check on something. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, begin thinking about what is it that you could use to upgrade your um, broadband services for students and teachers in the school. And, um, be ready when the windows open to file your forms to get the bids and to get everything you know done in place. So I see there are no more questions. Um, this I don't see anything in the chat. So one last look. See, um, does anyone have questions? Additional questions? <clears throat> okay. Well, then the hour is up. So we will. Close it, please feel free to reach out to me if I can be of assistance for this or for any of the government programs that we you know, hope you're being able to take advantage of. So thank you for being with us and I'll see you in a few weeks. We'll do one on um, IDEA and students serving students with disabilities. So thank you for participating.